All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to, I uh, feel like we're on. We're on? Yes. Thumbs up? All right. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to our second training class of the year. This is Embracing Advanced Fan, fan Training. Uh, we've got Brent Fullerton all the way from a Super Bowl winner all the way from Springfield, Missouri. Congratulations. Since Brent, you're uh, overdosed in Super Bowl wins compared to us, at least in the recent past. So congrats there. Um, a little context on this class. Um, you know, as a fan rep, we run into oddball things periodically. Uh, and sometimes it feels like they just don't get it. You know, they're, they're, you, you run into these specialty applications and then it goes a long time passes between. So this is a, a class sort of based around the itch that I really wanted to scratch. So I haven't ever sat in a class that covered specifically all these topics at the same time. Um, so I was excited that Brent was willing to do it and put it together kind of the way I wanted it. So thanks Brent for being able to pivot. Although you did have a lot of the stuff already, it seems like I'm not the only person with these questions. But um, Brent started with Cook maybe a couple of years before I started with Airflow. I started in 95. So Brent's done a lot of different roles at Lauren Cook. He's, uh, among other things, been a consulting engineer in the Cook Fan Engineering Group. He's now a regional. He spent a lot of time in the restaurant side of the business, which is like a direct, well, working directly with specialty restaurant type applications. So he's kind of done it all. Um, so we're lucky to have him today. I am not in the room because I'm taking advantage of our hybrid technology and I'm not feeling great. So there we have it, sports fans. Um, so without further ado, and, and then in the meeting, um, Caleb is gonna do some of the um, direct messaging with the folks that are there. And for the folks that are there, thanks for coming. Glad to have you in person, even though I'm not. I'm just a few feet away. And without further ado, uh, Brent, did I miss anything or did I cover it? You okay? got it. You got it? Okay. I'll be on mute and standing by. And um, thanks, everybody, once again for coming. Well, it's good to be here. Um, as Tom mentioned, Tom and I go way back, as well as with some of the other Airflow folks. I've managed other regions in the company and uh, took on Airflow the first of this year. So in front of the folks that are in person, there is a folder with a cornucopia of various um, documents and that type of thing. We'll reference some of those as we go through. And then there is also an engineering cookbook and a little toolkit with you as well. So there is a pencil in there if you want to scribble notes. If not, that's fine, but we'll also be referencing the engineering cookbook on and off throughout the day. As Tom mentioned, um, this is this is a little bit different seminar. I had a lot of fun putting it together. It's a lot of many topics all pulled together, and I have a lot of different little pass around, show and tell type items as well that we'll hit on. So um, one of the items that Tom used to um, advertise on this class, I, I reused on this, and that is actually a permanent magnet style motor cutaway. And I often get a lot of requests for what do they really look like because they're different. So I have some pull apart motors up here. We'll get into those here in a little bit. They all have different controllers. You can see they can go from very small to the size of which that I was not going to bring with me up here. Um, so we're kind of just jump in. Um, I, I like to do things, as Tom mentioned, I used to be a consultant many years ago. I actually was a consultant to cook um, before Jerry gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. And, uh, but where I'm going with that is if you have a question, please don't hold off on it. Um, just raise your hand, ask away, we'll go from there. Um, if it's something that I'm getting ready to, I'll, I'll just say, hey, let's put a pin in it for a minute and then I'll, I'll have something um, 
with presentations and or supporting documents on that. If there's nothing outstanding questions right off the bat, let's jump in. So, got to remember to turn on the roll. All right. I think when we did, let's see here. Yeah, okay, now we're back and going. Okay, if you've heard the term Veriflow, I'm going to be very transparent. It's a marketing term. Every fan manufacturer and most other manufacturers used a marketing term for their EC and their permanent magnet motors. Now, you may be asking, I've heard the term ECM. I've heard the term EC. I've heard the term PM. There actually is a little bit difference between each of the three. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But there's similarities across the board. Um, one of the reasons there's marketing names utilized by different manufacturers, it actually comes apart because how many of you have ever heard of NEMA MG1? Anybody ever heard of that? I mean, I know we're mainly mechanicals here, but we dive into the sparky realm every now and then. That is an a great big standard having to do with motors. Well, it doesn't get into the nitty gritty in these styles of motors the way it does other types of motors. So that's why some of this comes about. And that's also why there's these motors are different from different manufacturers, but they ultimately come about and do similar items. So um, we do have a motors and controls product guide. It's no longer in print. It's a PDF. Uh, you can get it off the website. But one of the things that I really like, and this is not a cook deal. While this is a little cook slide, we came up with this, and this has even been referenced by other folks. This is boiling it down to the simplest components from the standpoint of three primary styles of EC and permanent magnet style motors. Notice once again, I am not saying the word ECM. ECM is a little bit different motor. It's more like what you see in a fan power box. It automatically responds, ramps up and ramps down. An EC motor or a PM motor does not adjust the speed it runs unless it has a signal either delivered manually to it or by controls. So that's the main difference. Are we clear? Okay. So the standard EC, once again, we just did this to simplify explanations. It is what it is. It comes from the motor factory a specific horsepower. You cannot change the horsepower, but you can adjust the speed. In the beginning, when these motors first came out, you had the choice. You could either adjust the speed by an onboard speed pot, or you could have one built that could be delivered with a control signal wire that you could deliver it that way. You couldn't do both. There are some motors still in the industry to this day that are either or. The majority of the motors now can accept either one. Now, the reason I say that is an example of one that is like a speed pot only is this little tiny one. They just don't have the ability to put the rest of the controls in this small, small of a motor. Now, we go just a little bit larger, and you can get that. Okay. So the point of the matter is this style of motor that can only do like one of these speed knobs is a little less expensive than the one that can take both. They all have a purpose, but it's not necessarily everything all in one. The next step up is a programmable EC. And I'll get into the difference between an EC and a PM here in just a minute. But a programmable EC is basically a motor blank that comes from the motor manufacturer. 
And when I say a motor blank, the fan manufacturer programs what horsepower and torque at the time it's pulled out of a stock room and it's installed on a fan. Now, we often get questions of, hey, can we change some of this in the field and reprogram it and everything else? Well, then we get into something, how many of you have heard of UL? If you haven't heard a lot about it before, we're gonna talk about it later on this morning. But we get into some UL issues. So once that motor is programmed, it's deliberately set up where it can't be reprogrammed because then you all gets into a little bit of a um, concern, okay? But this type can accept a zero to 10 volt signal or it can have an onboard speed. From this specific motor manufacturer, it actually has a little LED readout. I'll go ahead and pass that around. Um, Y'all can pass that. But the point of the matter is these first two are called EC. So what makes the difference between an EC and a PM motor? Because all three have permanent magnet, just like that photo that uh, Tom advertised for this class. Well, at the heart of the motor, it is actually a DC motor. I'll let that sink in. Do we run on DC in the standard uh, building setup? No, we don't. So we have to have a way to convert AC signal to DC signal. Well, with an EC motor, that device is built in and it is either in or on the motor itself. On a programmable PM motor, it uses a motor controller to convert the AC signal to DC to let the motor run. Still comes from the manufacturer being the fan manufacturer set up and ready to go. You don't have to have some electrician get out there and come up with some sort of motor controller and every type of thing on that. But this allows for larger horsepower ranges until the motor manufacturers catch up to the internal style controls to go from there. That's also allowing us to get into like three phase and the different voltages from that as well. So this um, three breakout was something that's not cook speak, but trying to simplify this motor industry and this popularity down that. And as I said, it's been used by a lot of folks. We did come up with it. Um, I need to update part of this slide. It says only offered up to one horsepower on the programmable EC. It goes larger now. But uh, when we did that, that was really kind of pushing the limits back then. Okay, so in your um, folder, you will find a booklet that looks like what you see on the screen. I'm gonna pull a few select passages out and we're gonna talk about it. But this was, I logged all the questions I got for five plus years on these styles of motors and these controls and codes and everything else. So did the other regionals for Lauren Cook. So did some of the engineering team, the application engineers. And we actually compiled this book to specifically address these different questions that we all got. Because the truth of the matter is, we got a lot of the same questions over that time period from different parts of the United States as well as international. And we even got some of the same questions from some of the same people. So let's put it all in a book to try to make everybody's life a little simpler and have that. Once again, we put this back in there. Um, that's the cutaway like showed. So I've already gone into detail. I skipped ahead um, and talked about the difference between an EC and a permanent magnet motor. But here's a cutaway one, and I failed to bring that pull apart one. But this 
is the standard EC motor, and you can see how it's pulled away. There is a permanent magnet motor, permanent magnet in here. Now, what goes into making a permanent magnet? Rare earth metals. Okay, so are these something that are readily produced? No. These motors can be final assembled in the United States, but I don't care who the motor manufacturer is. To this date, there is not one of these motors that is fully manufactured within the United States. I cannot tell you how many times I see that in specifications. Now, Truth be told, I'm not as familiar with specifications from this area as I am with my other regions, my other part of the region that I've covered for 20 years, but um, I frequently see this. I see this either on military specs, I see this on other types of government specs, and it's like, yeah, I wish it was, it doesn't exist. So just be aware. Um, during some of the COVID items, it was one of the things from the standpoint of we had a couple of containers of these sitting off the port of Long Beach for more than six months because they couldn't get the container unloaded. Now, that doesn't say that we don't keep a whole lot of inventory, but then also the motor manufacturers have to produce them and do final assembly and that type of thing as well. So, uh, the question that comes up, what's, what is an EC motor and how does that differ from a traditional? Everything that I shared up to now, right there in that booklet, you can see that. Electronically commutated, I already shared that, controls the deal, and it's different than a standard squirrel cage. Point being is I'm gonna keep drawing back to this booklet because when you leave here, whether you wanna pull this up and watch again, or you want to just have a booklet to go back and what's that bald head guy tell me it way too early in the morning on a Valentine's Day, but uh, you can go back and reference this and, and go from there. And, and it's not just something that I pulled out of my head standing up here talking to you, but you've got this documented and you can go back and reference it from time to time. Okay, so that free program that I showed you Earlier on the cutaway, this is what it looks like. This is it pulled apart, and I sent that controller around. That controller is one manufacturer specific, okay? But it's a pretty popular item on there. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. So everybody got a chance to see that. Not every motor has this. Like I said, it's just one manufacturer specific, but it's a pretty cool option. It's incredibly handy if you're working with a test and balance. We'll talk more about test and balance a little bit later on. Why is it handy? Because it tells you specifically the speed at which the motor shaft is operating. Okay. This is an example of a simple power roof ventilator with one of these on. You pop the top right off, there you go, and you can see it. Something hey, is- Hey, Brent. Yes. Hey, it's Tom. Uh, just by the by, there's, there's um, looks like we have like 42 people online. If you guys have any questions, just use the Q&A function. If you wanna reach someone individually, um, who's hosting, you can use the chat, but um, I just got a question from Heidi and I'll put, post a link uh, for this publication. I'll put it in the notes. Outstanding, thank you. And if you get a question online, please interrupt and, and let's address it right then. Sounds so, good. So this blower that is shown with one of the EC motors is actually right behind the screen. One just like it. And that's for the fan demo. That's for the system effect demo. And if you're not enrolled for the Thursday class, 
I'm sure we can find a way to fit you in on the Thursday class. You can see it live and in person. Sorry, I had to get my Diet Mountain Dew hit on top. Um, but that power roof ventilator, there's also one in the atrium right out here as well. So it goes from there. Now, you don't get the Rasmus Jazz plexiglass version out in the field, obviously. But we use this to show how the motor is on there. This is a direct drive. This is actually an arrangement for. So we'll talk about fan arrangements a little bit more on the intro class on Thursday, but also in the engineering cookbook goes from there. I've had, unfortunately, during the COVID years, more folks get themselves in trouble not going through the different fan arrangements of what they need for a specific client. Either they weren't able to go to a job site or working remote and not some of the cross-checking that happens in a local office that normally happens. So I have seen a lot of that. So I've gone back on my bandwagon kick of talking about the AMCA fan arrangements. It's also recognized under ASHRAE guidelines as well. So this is an arrangement for the motor shaft is directly connected to the wheel of the blower. And this is another view. Once again, let's go back to the EC versus PM. And specifically with the PM, it's a larger horsepower and it needs a motor controller. Now, what do we use as a motor controller to make these work? Well, we can use a wide range of things, but the simplest item that we can use in most cases for a motor controller is this really unusual product. Probably you've never heard of it before. It's called a VFD. Yeah. So that's a cutaway of a permanent magnet motor. You can see how it's different than the standard squirrel cage. And so we connect it with a VFD that has an, a PM output signal. And it goes right there. So a permanent magnet motor plus a motor controller is the same as if we had it all from the motor manufacturer. And they are working to keep upping the horsepower availability of having it on or in the motor, the various motor manufacturers. But nobody's gotten it all the way across the full horsepower range. We can do a 30 horsepower permanent magnet motor, have been able to do that for more than 10 years, piece of cake. Okay. Now, back in the old days, when I was a consultant, a VFD, oh my word, we're going to break the bank. And if we were doing one of our industrials, we were actually dealing with DC. Okay. And once again, simplified cliff notes back to what we've already talked about back in the booklet. Uh, do you need a VFD with an EC or PM motor? Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a power roof ventilator. If you have a permanent magnet motor, which is a horsepower that's larger than the EC, you have to have a motor controller. So you can see, particularly on this one, this is an example on a power roof ventilator. Well, why did we do it on this one? Well, this was back before you could get a three phase style. So the simplest way on that was we took a permanent magnet motor, put the VFD on it, used the PM output signal, and made it work. Easy peasy. Now, this is one of my favorite pictures. And the reason I, it is, is because this is the exact same blower, size-wise. You can tell it's a little different. The one on the right is what? It has an EC motor. The one on the left is what? It's a permanent magnet motor. So for the performance point, we required more horsepower. So on the left, the permanent magnet motor has more horsepower capability than what the EC motor was capable of being provided with from any motor manufacturer. So they're both arrangement fours, and it goes from there. 
Now, this is an industrial material handler. This was a very, very wise industrial um, client that we worked with. He wanted one of these style of motors on all of his units. And you can see there's several shown in there. There's actually 22. Now, for this, you will notice, and let's see here. Right here, can everybody see where my arrow is? That is a motor controller. I said we could use a VFD or we could come up with a motor controller. That's a motor controller. <clears throat> that was a specialty style of box because on a material handler, we're using that for a specific reason. It's an industrial process. It's dirty, dusty, and ugly. So you normally don't just put a VFD out there, even if you have one of the specialty enclosures on it. So it went from there. Why did he want this? Well, first off, and you can go back to the booklet on this, if you're adjusting the speed, that's where you're saving energy. And he was adjusting the speed. These were not constant volume units. Okay, the fact that these were not constant volume lended the opportunity for energy savings. Okay, so he made the additional investment knowing that these 22 units would be ramping up and ramping down throughout the day. A lot of them were used 24-7. And so he was getting that incremental energy savings. So he'd done some of the fat figure calculation on the front end. We provided some of the additional information on the back end. And we did this on material handlers. Do you see this in our engineering software? No. Do you see this in a lot of marketing catalogs? No. Why? It's a specialty type application. Doesn't mean that we can't do it. Doesn't mean that we haven't always done it. But for nine out of 10 applications and installations and probably 9.5 out of 10 consulting offices, you're not gonna run into one of these things, okay? But they are available. So this leads me directly into what we talked about. Are they more efficient than the traditional AC induction? And AC induction is the standard type of motor that you're most familiar with. This is a squirrel cage, okay? And there are motor losses, but you can see right there from the chart how they really come into play depending upon the amount of turndown. Um, or across the speed range as we reference it in the book. All right, some other ones, motors all create heat. And I'm not gonna sit here and read all this to you, but I am gonna hit the top end. But the controllability is, is one of the really popular items with these style of motors over that. And it's a lot simpler on the install with these styles. A lot of the reasons they are. Now, are they more expensive than a squirrel cage motor? Yes, they absolutely are. Are they coming down in price every five years? Yes. Do they have more options available now than they did five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Yes. But if you're keeping them constant speed and you're not adjusting the speed, then you need to do some head scratching on, is this an appropriate type of technology? Not saying it's not, sometimes it is. A lot of times it can be. And sometimes depending upon where you are working on a project, you may not have a choice. Okay. All right. And why did I lead into that? Knowing exactly what was next here, and you can always go to um, energycodes.gov and see what's current and that type of thing. If you really want to get back into it, the 2015 and later International Energy Code, one horsepower um, 
you, you, or less you, you have to have an EC style motor. There's some gray area on part of that. We can get into the whole 90.1, 189, that type of thing. That's really a little bit past this, uh, this seminar, but uh, I do want you to know where you can go and, and get some updates and, and address certain questions that you might have. And probably several in here have already very familiar with this, but I like to keep everybody on the same um, playing field. Uh, how long until PSC motors are phased out? That's a great question, Josh. And I would say the answer is nobody knows because a lot of the highly inefficient PSC and shaded pole motors have already been whacked out of existence. Um, they're still very cost effective. And as we keep trying to drive the efficiency levels up, you will hit a point at which you're past the technology of that motor. But right now, you're still at an efficiency point where you're within a range that those motors still are available. So that's a great question. Uh, my best guess is they're still gonna be around for at least another 10 years, maybe a little longer. Um, but with the stroke of a pen, that could all change tomorrow. So um, that building, that energycodes.gov, that's a sample of what the website looks like. If you've never been there, you can go online and look at that and, and go from there. Um, and then back to my statement that I made earlier, does one cost more than the other? Well, a Veriflow motor, once again, marketing term, plus controls is less expensive than an AC motor plus a VFD plus the third party controls in almost every case. Okay. And we're back to that. Now, the reason going back to the showing those different ones, and what did I mention about adjusting the speed? If you're not adjusting the speed, unless you're being driven to this from some other item, stay in the AC motor world. But when you're adjusting the speed, there's different ways to adjust the speed. You can adjust them local, as I've shown you some of these different types, whether it's an EC or PM motor, or you can adjust it via control signal. And that's where we're gonna get to here in just a little bit. Okay, so this is a natural little break point. Um, any questions? Do we have any online or anything else like that? Oh, so I want. <laughs> All right. Good deal. All right. Yes. There is one. I just want to double check that you're going to be covering. I think you are, but uh, Ben Patterson uh, asked Do you have to consider the level of park particulates in the airstream when selecting a standard motor versus an EC PM motor? Um, will particulates in the airstream stick to the fan, I'm sorry, to the shaft fan wheel similar to ferrite sticking to shaft impeller and EC pump if there isn't a magnetic filter or separator? That's an outstanding question. And I, I uh, you said it was Ben. Um, yes, so we're gonna get into um, the different motor enclosures a little bit later on, I pulled that in. Um, that was kind of a surprise for Tom. We had talked that we were gonna do it, but it's towards the end. But the simple question, answer to Ben's question right now at this part is the simple answer is yes. So you have to be concerned whether it is a direct drive EC or PM style motor, or whether it is a standard AC induction motor You've got to be concerned about the environment that the motor might be placed. Now, further along those lines, there are different motor enclosure types for not only an EC motor, but also an AC style motor. Now, why do we have different enclosure types? Well, one, it depends upon where the motor is gonna be located. So the motor has to be 
done differently internally. Uh, heat sinks, temperature ratings, that type of thing. This, as you can tell, is a totally enclosed motor. It's actually non-ventilated. Do you see any holes into this motor? No. So this is actually known as a TENV. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. Basically, once again, because some of these topics have come up more frequently in the last three years than ever. Now, I think there was also a further secondary or, or third part to that question just a little bit ago as far as magnetics. And that is always a concern whether you have an AC style motor or an EC style motor. And just as a precursor on that, you can have magnetics develop from the motor operation and you can have magnetics develop from the electrical system itself. And jumping ahead a little bit, if you have an AC motor and you put a shaft grounding ring on it, don't assume that's a get out of jail free card. Put a pin in that and we'll come back to that here in a little bit. All right, excellent. Any other questions? Um, I guess just to follow up on the <clears throat> on Ben's question, the the particulate in the airstream, so not where the fan is, or not where the motor is itself, but what's actually going through the fan. Um, I think you kind of touched on that, but just for clarity, like, is there anything, any kind of particulate in the airstream that can affect the motor? Yes, okay. there are, okay. and it can be either gases. Or it can also be specific particle. Okay. So it can affect the motor not only by loading up the wheel and sending the wheel into a vibration type deal that can affect the motor by the shaft. There are also some cases where the magnetics can actually affect a few things, the electrical, and there's a couple other things from that standpoint. But the primary one is. You get a dirty wheel, I don't care whether it's a grease laden fan, I don't care whether it's just dust, dirt, and gunk in the airstream. I can screw up anybody's fan and make it a nightmare very easy. And I I mean, certain fans, that's one of the reasons why I showed you a material handler. It can handle dirtier airstreams than like a, a power roof ventilator. I have seen more power roof ventilators used as, or a little lightweight utility vent set used as what I would call a process fan than for a cleaner atmosphere, what they were designed for. Now, did I say that they couldn't handle some of it? No, I didn't. But I will say that particularly as budgets get tighter or lead times aren't planned for, I've seen all sorts of wild things take place. And uh, um, so, yes, you can mess up a motor, you can mess up a fan, all by the system that it is installed, electrical or otherwise. Okay, with that being the case, let's jump into an overview on controls. Yes, part of this is cook specific, but not all. And the reason we have this in here is, A, when you get into the EC and PM motor world, you get into a lot bigger world than you have with an AC world. Now, yes, there's some projects. You've got an entire secondary control system. You've got a whole other set of plans just for the controls. Get it. Not a problem. There's sometimes you want part of that world and you don't want to get into the heavy end of that. Makes sense? Sometimes you want some of those features. Sometimes you just want to go back into an existing building and add a couple of things on here. That's one of the reasons 
that these motors are so popular. And I'm going to not only show you some of the cook world controls, but hopefully give you some other ideas because you're, you're landing a zero to 10 volt sink, a 24 volt control type sink, okay? One of those styles, and you're being able to control things. Okay, pretty easy peasy if you really get down to it. So let's talk about this and, and dive in. So once again, the two uh, booklets, but here's an overview of some of these. Now, this is a two-speed controller. I have it on this unit right here, this demo unit. Why would I have a two-speed? Well, how many of you have dealt with uh, bathroom exhaust? Not very sexy, but you've dealt with bathroom exhaust controls, particularly for the last five years. You got to have an occupied and an unoccupied mode. Where it used to be, it was tie it with the light switch and move on, showing my age from back when I had hair. Okay, did that. Or you put a little motion control sensor and went from there. Well, I can set this on high and low. And it, it hits a motion control and it kicks to the high and goes back to the low. If I'd stop walking around or we'd stop having movement within the range of that. Okay, pretty cool. So it's an easy path to code compliance. Makes sense. Now, those of you that are not aware, a lot of motor manufacturers have been consolidating over the last 10 to 15 years to the point at which it's very, very challenging to get some styles of motors. I have a few states that I've had in my area that some of the universities, I'm the university of so-and-so, and by golly, I'm going to change the industry and all I want is a cast iron motor. Great. Enjoy your 52 to 104 week lead time on that motor. You think I'm crazy? Motor manufacturers have really gotten out of styles of motors that aren't profitable. Did I say they didn't exist? No. But one of the styles of motors that have pretty much gone the way of the wildebeest as VFDs have become more available is an actual two-speed motor. A two-speed motor can be set up a 50% split, AKA a 1725, 860 RPM motor, or it can be set up on a one-third, two-thirds split, 1725, 1140. There are some folks that will still make them at different horsepower ranges. Why? It's a legacy type product and they're still set up for it and go from there. But I don't care what state university you are. I don't care what hospital you are. You can jump up and down and throw a temper fit and you cannot force a motor manufacturer to build something they don't want to build. They may price it to the moon and give you a lead time that's ungodly and then you'll find out. So how do we get around that? And the perfect example is an old um, friend of mine that uh, I went to undergrad with was a consulting engineer in one of my regions, and he had a university just like that. They had a motor burnout, and he had some experience of trying to find a replacement motor because that university wanted a cast iron housing and a two-speed motor. And he was having the dickens. So he called in a favor, gave me a call, said, hey, can you make a couple of calls and see what you can do? I said, I can, but you're pretty much up the proverbial creek without a paddle and your boat's taking on a lot of water and it isn't pretty clean water either. But we made some calls. He found one motor manufacturer that agreed to make it in 52 weeks. I found one that was able to make it in 48. Woohoo! big deal. And truth be told, that one that was 48, it was probably going to be 52 anyway by the time it was done. He said, well, what am I going to do? I said, well, you got a couple of choices. You can wait 52 weeks. Well, that's not acceptable. But I'm just telling you that that's one of your choices. You can wait 52 weeks. You can take a standard AC induction motor 
and you can put a VFD on it. Oh, no, 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 we can't have a VFD. No, they're scared to death on the VFD. And even if we did a VFD, it could be only this one manufacturer on this entire thing. We can't do it. And I said, hey, hey, let me buy you a beer. It, it, it'll be okay. You know, we'll figure something out. You're just going to have to give the different options. I said, and the third option, you can go with one of these two speed controllers and go into the ECPM motor. Well, that, that, that scared him on that. Hop, that. I said, well, for this particular one, it was a 10 horsepower motor. So you're in permanent magnet. I said, he's going to get a VFD whether he knows it or not. Oh, Lord. Oh, yeah, I, I you buy you a beer. Just here's the three choices. Okay. Now, this two speed controller, why did we come up with it? There's ways to wire it up differently. But we did this in a box and we did it to simplify things. We also had one very specific control contractor that went in and started cutting wires and not reading wiring diagrams or anything else like that, flipping that. I know there is no one here that's ever had that experience with people not reading wiring diagrams or going in and clipping wires or anything else like that. I know that only was in this one place. All right now it happens all the time and that's not me throwing mud it's just hey there's a reason why there's wiring diagrams there's reasons why there's things like that so we came up with a nice little box put things in there so ultimately my old colleague what do you think he went with the, the university had a complete stroke on the 52 weeks and really i even told him i said you know it's partly cloudy if you really will get it in 52 weeks. So now if you want to do something, order about four motors at the same time. So you'll have some spares. Um, they ultimately went with this style of technology. One, A, it was a two-speed. So they had a high and a low. B, it came all mounted and wired from a manufacturer. So they didn't have that spasm shall we say of having their facility guys get into the world of dealing with vfd i still don't really understand why it was that much of a spasm but it was um and it went from there and to my knowledge that fan's still running just fine but it was a new way of thinking to address an age-old system that really it was more of an educational opportunity of, okay, there's nothing wrong with your system design. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just some of the things aren't made anymore. Hey, I'm not too happy that I'm not gonna be able to get a V6 on my sport utility anymore on this either way. Am I skeptical that the twin turbocharged four banger is gonna give me the same amount of horsepower as my V6? When I get the next version of my sport utility in four years, I'm a little skeptical, but guess what? I can't jump up and down and throw a hissy fit and expect them to build me a V6. Hey, Brent. Yeah. Just a quick question for you. So, so fan law wise, let's say your balancer gets out to the job site and they balance the fan on high speed in your your zero to 10 is set at eight. Um, I know with like Venturi valves and things like that, there's an internal curve, but theoretically, if you set the, if you set speed two to four, theoretically, that should be exactly half, theoretically. How does it work out in reality or do you need the balancer to do it twice? Theoretically, it should work out, but it doesn't ever hurt. If you need to be that amount of precision, you do need to have the balancer do it twice. Okay. okay. And here's the reason why. In most cases, every system has a certain amount of turbulence. Turbulence is not able to be measured with a pitot tube. A pitot tube does not have the capability of measuring turbulence. Okay. So it all has to do with the with precision versus accuracy that all all going back to that so 
it should follow up and down and we'll talk a little bit about that here later on but in most cases the tolerance factor i would say unless the system is very very funky you're going to be fine you're going to be within a tolerance factor that everybody can live with going up and down and back and forth okay so that's a great question so that's the two-speed controller right belabor the point on that a little bit there's all sorts of wiring diagrams on this and that type of thing for a simpler way um we also have so failed to pass this around while i was talking this is the two-speed controller this is something that we call an air balance kit you don't have to get this from us but this is once again, something that we came up with to simplify things because there's a 24 volt control transformer. It's all different things. And specifically this one box came about from a specific test and balance contractor that went in and clipped wires <laughs> and made a mountain out of molehill, got an owner upset, it was one of my class colleagues in a different town. And I mean, he even didn't even, when he rewired it, didn't even put the same wiring colors back together. So we have this basically to make life a whole lot easier for folks. But if you want to come up with your own deal out there with a 24 volt control transformer and everything else, you certainly can. But we'll pass those around and go from there. So the air balance kit. It's a control hub. Think of that as a control hub. The two-speed controller is the control hub with the ability to set whatever you want for the high and whatever you want for the low. Now, remember, I said on a two-speed motor, you had a 50% split or a one-third, two-thirds split. That was it. Now you can set whatever you want on the high, whatever you want on the low, and you don't have to get in and control, set up a whole bunch of algorithms and everything else. What's the difference between the air balance kit and a pot? Um, the air balance kit has everything um, to actually control it. And it can take a remote speed control pot on that from that. So you can actually tie in and it also allows you to tie in the damper motor as well on that. Well, like I said, all of this can be accomplished without it. This is just something that we sell that makes life easier. Okay. And the two speed controller, we've got all this stuff in here. The other thing that comes up a lot <coughs> is a pressure control. Now, you can get a pressure controller from us, you can get a pressure controller from somebody else. Once again, you're delivering that signal, you're setting that up for a range. Now, one thing that I will stress on a pressure controller, there are different performance ranges for different types of pressure controllers. In this case, more is not better. Try to get it to your actual tolerance range for your actual system as close as you can. In other words, if you have a zero to two inch, and you know you're never going to go above three quarters of an inch pressure, don't get the zero to two, get the zero to one. Because the further you get away from your pressure system versus the range on this, the less accurate it gets. Make sense? So that's a pressure controller. That one has to be kept indoors. You can also get into one that's set up for outdoor use. That's more customized. That's not off the shelf, that's custom built. And once again, you can have those built by others. It doesn't have to come from us. We've just built a system where you can get things from us or you can get things from others that ties into items and goes from there. The motors don't care, but you do have to have certain items to allow the motors to talk. 
and receive the information they need. We've just given you a simplified framework of getting that. Okay, and the remote speed pod that Josh brought up earlier. Now, on a little PSC or shaded pole motor, you've also often seen a fan speed controller that looks a lot like this. And if you haven't, you'll see a picture of it later. Those actually switch the motor frequency, cut it on, off, so it goes through the sine wave. This does not. This you can actually put in a two four by four box in a room and allow somebody to speed it up, speed it down. On a fan speed controller, please do not ever do that. It is not an on off switch. It's more like a balancing switch. And speaking from experience, I had a national account that they put it in a break room and they had employees turn it up, turn it down. Well, remember I said it was chopping the sine wave burn up motors all over the place, left and right. Those motors aren't designed for that. They can't handle it. So there's a difference between the two. So this outputs a zero to 10 volt signal, speed ups, speed down, you can adjust it and go from there. And you can also, if you really want to get to it, you can set a tolerance range on the motor. So, if you have somebody that really likes to crank the knob, you can limit what their cranking of the knob actually does, but it goes from there. Now, this is the fun stuff. I wish my hotel room last night would have had one of these. It worked a little bit better. Um, good thing I know how to disable a couple of things. Is this being recorded? Oh, well. Okay. So this little controller, we call it the IAQ controller, but it, it has different trim levels. It can be tied into a building management system or it can be local. So it can be set from a temperature controller. So one of the really cool things, did this several years ago, take one of those, uh, we call it a Gemini, but it's, it's a large cabinet fan. Take one of those on a data closet. Something similar to like that. It gets hot in the data closet. You set this temperature and it kicks it to a high speed on exhaust. So you're circulating more air. Done it a bunch of times. Okay. Now, humidity. Had a rural school, actually in a bordering state right here. And, um, when I say rural school, it was about an hour away from anybody else. They built a nice new gymnasium and locker room. They definitely had a humidity problem. They didn't want anything complicated at all. They put a couple of power roof ventilators up on the roof. They put one of these in each of the locker rooms, set the humidity level. And then when the humidity level got so high, kicked it to the higher exhaust speed, got that humidity out and went from there. Pretty simple, pretty easy peasy, makes sense? And it was something that was easily able to be retrofitted into that. CO2 controller. I have one uh, consulting firm that I make, and I have for 20 some years, made regular visits to their corporate headquarters and then presentations. They have a 75 person office room. It can be split in half, but you start getting about 50 people in there and it can get a little stuck. Um, we put two of these, one on each half in the CO2 controller, because what happens when you get a room, you get a lot of people in there. CO2 levels go up, right? Often, you know, it's not, it's not always the presenter because it's causing you to get a little sleepy, but it's that level of CO2. So we put one of these controllers on each half in there and then kick it to a higher speed and then go from there. So started getting a whole lot more people in there, kicked it up, went from there. And then finally a VOC controller. Now, as I said, this is the top end. This has the most features and you can come about with a, a combination of, of two from there. 
if you wanted to control it from two different aspects. But uh, just going about some of those different controllers. Can you interface those with a building management system? Yes, you can. Um, you need to get the uh, right building management system option, but it, it can be done. It's not difficult. And you can tie it in with the pressure controls. Now, one of the things, and you've got this, and I'm sorry for those of you who are remote, we do not have this online, um, but we do have a booklet of pressure control basics. And we go into a lot of different things on that and uh, get a hold of the folks from Airflow if you are online and would like a copy of that, and we'll figure out a way to get you a copy. Uh, but this goes back to pressure control basics 101, as I mentioned. Um, and, and a couple of things, this has come up frequently as more of these control aspects get out in the field. And um, you go from there, particularly with the pressure controllers, different things like that. And uh, also different types of systems, stairwell pressurizations. I know on uh, Tom's outline, he mentioned something about smoke control. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. And everything for dryer exhaust, you gotta be very careful on the types of equipment because going back to the earlier question, I think it was Ben that had mentioned the question about things in the environment um, or the system, very specifically dryer exhaust is one of them that comes to mind. Please have filters. I mean, these are not material handlers. I've, I've seen everything gambit wise on there. And you start getting dryer lint and it'll destroy anything. You'll load it up and it'll just destroy. And unfortunately, not a lot of people like to clean the dryer vent. Went out. All right, true confession time. How many of you do it on a regular basis with your dryers at home? And those that do, did you learn the hard way? Or, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, okay. Um, you can have negative versus positive pressure control and go from there. Now, EC and PM motors. Those are for direct drive fans. I saved this that one point up to now. Why is it for a direct drive fan? Because they don't have the torque capability currently to overcome the bone friction. We'll talk a little bit more in detail on that later on. But what if you want to use these types of controls with a belt drive fan. Are you up the proverbial creek without a paddle? No, there's ways to do it. You do it with actually a VFD. And see right there, giving you your crib notes so you don't have to spend the whole morning writing notes. And uh, you can, we call it simply drive. It's just a marketing term. You can get a mounted VFD from us or you can do one in the field either way and you can land the controls to it and go from there. Now, this is a natural breaking point. I'm actually five minutes ahead of my own internal schedule. Uh, Tom had advertised a deep dive on belt drive versus direct drive, and that's what I plan to do. Um, I highly advise you hit the caffeine before we get into this. So if you wanna take advantage of that five minutes that we're ahead of the schedule, grab a drink, soda, I would do that and then we'll we'll get on the scuba gear and we'll go into a deep dive. Hey Brett. Yeah. With system <clears throat> All right. So everybody get a chance to get all caffeined up. Hold it through. And we've got the camera, the extra cameras working again. So Hello, camera back up on the back wall. And uh, if anybody remotely is having any issues, send them a note and we'll go from there. So, thus beginneth our deep dive on belt drive versus direct drive. And I think Tom even promised some extra PDHs if you knew all the answer to this. Is that right? Is that right, Tom? 
isn't in the meeting right now. Okay, very good. All right, so let's jump in here. Belt drive fan, very simply put, it has a belt that moves the power from the motor to the fan shaft, pretty simple. This is what a typical one looks like from a different view. Are there friction points? There definitely are. Shivs and belts. That's a shiv. Those uh, gray type devices and obviously a belt. So I often have folks that want to see what one of these looks like. So this is a fixed shiv. Okay, this is also a single groove. What I'm showing up on the screen is a variable shift. So the variable shift opens and closes and it adjusts the speed. So, um, here's one that's open. This is the variable shift. You can see it opens and closes. It moves the belt up and down. And that. How much can you change the RPM typically? That's outstanding question. That depends upon the shift. So we'll see. So they're all shifts are have a five revolution range. I'm going to tell you a good rule of thumb is about fifteen percent. And that's on the safe side, but um, the actual drive selection, computer selection, will actually tell you that range based upon that. And I'm being a little overly conservative on some, and I'm being aggressive when I say the 15%. Um, but the fixed shift, you got that. And then what if you need to, to put it on a shaft and it's got a different... Shaft diameter. Well, this is a bushy, okay? And that's how that works on that. I'm not gonna pass that around because that's got a little bit of grease on it. I don't think anybody wants grease with their, with their sweet. All right, obviously a belt. There's all sorts of different belt manufacturers. These are not the types of belts for the fan world. You can go down to an automotive store and get a replacement. I cannot stress that enough. They're completely different construction. Uh, it's one thing if you want to do something for a day until you can get the other type of belt, but don't expect the performance to be correct. Don't expect the performance to last. Um, I'd avoid it at all costs. Um, Actually, I've seen some enterprising people that instead of getting an automotive belt, they'll use a, they'll cut off the end of a pair of pantyhose and, and loop it around and do that before they do that. I've seen all sorts of things in the field. Um, so let's talk about that fan speed adjustment right there. So this is a little browning book. You can go online and get it. And let's talk about some troubleshooting. You have to have everything in line. Okay, there's a lot of pros for a belt-driven fan. That's why they're around. There are also cons. There's also pros and cons for a direct drive fan. And I get people ask me all the time, which one should I use, belt or direct drive fan? Which one's better? The answer is it depends. But what I'm trying to do in the steep dive is to give you all the tools so you can make that evaluation not only for your client, but also the application and go from there. So you have to line it. There's some thou shalt nots, particularly parallel is not with the base of the shiv. It's with the path of travel for the belt. Makes sense. I'll show that a little bit. Now, um, those of you that have already seen the shiv, is that a product that you think could wear? Absolutely, it can wear, and it does wear frequently to the point that there are 
group gauges available you can stick in and you can see if that belt has worn the shiv. A belt will wear a shiv over a period of time. And if you've got a good TMB guy, it's going out there and adjusting or a good maintenance guy, he's got one of those and he checks that. And when you get the wear, you change it. And you'll notice as belts start to wear off, depending upon the quality of the belt, because a belt is not rubber all the way through. There are actually um, fibrous membranes that are in the belt to allow that to run longer, just like your tire. Your tire is not solid rubber, unless you're dealing with something like a go-kart tire or something like that. Okay. Um, all sorts of things on there. You can have those wibble wobble. Um, the IONMs, our IONM has a lot of that included in it. Our competitors do as well. Why do we have it in there? It's because it all comes from the shiv and the belt manufacturer and we're passing on that information. One of the things that I had done up a long time ago um, is because so many people get the correct alignment incorrect. Once again, it's not the face of the ship. It's the path of travel. And if you have it out of alignment, like what we show on the bottom one, you will wear the shivs, you will wear the belt, and you will have it go out. Hey, this lousy, no good fan. And at the end of the day, it's really something like that. Now, if you have multiple belts and you have incorrect alignment like that, you can even cause bearings to go out. You can cause bearing failures. You can cause the entire power assembly to start to tear itself apart, uh, particularly with high horsepower and different things along those lines. This is a perfect example. So we talk about that in the IOM, but I have this picture right here. This is a fully Worn shiv. Notice that that hole where the shaft goes through is not round. It's oblong. How did that happen? Because they didn't get the alignment right and it started doing this wobble. And even though that's a pretty solid device, that casting, it will wear over a period of time. So I didn't get to see a video of it, but I could tell exactly when I got it got that shiv, got a picture of it. It was doing this the whole doggone time. Now, do you have set screws? Do you have some things that kind of hold that on the shaft? Yeah, but that still doesn't mean that it's not gonna rock. So you've got to check these things. Test and balance report. I love them. You can, you can tell a lot. You can tell if it was filled out in a McDonald's restaurant or if it was filled out in the field. You can tell a lot of things. We have our own version just to get some more data. Um, the one thing on this particular one, um, I really enjoyed that the fan RPM uh, in conjunction with the variable frequency drive that was running um, was pretty close. This guy did a good job. Um, so what if you run over 60 hertz? Well, if you run over 60 hertz, which the shiv and belt setup is set up for 60 hertz, and Tom had asked the question earlier, it's going to run faster. If you run below the 60 hertz, it's going to run slower. Make sense? Okay. So let's address... The belt drive, I can. I used to have this little tabletop demo I take along, and then it became a whole lot easier just after we got it all filmed uh, from our uh, our uh, interactive tech center. And so we actually have a video, and let's see if all the technology works. So this is off of our YouTube channel. You guys can go back and reference this later. But I'm going to go ahead and let this run. Let's see if everything works.
Fan speed, how fast the fan impeller rotates, is a key factor affecting fan performance. As you can see from this typical performance fan curve, as the speed increases, the fan is able to deliver more airflow and develop more pressure. The fan speed here is indicated as fan RPM or revolutions per minute. Understanding how to set or change fan speed for a belt drive is an essential part of ensuring proper fan performance. Let's see how this works. Most belt driven fans utilize motors that rotate at a nominal speed of 1750 RPM. Other motor speeds you may commonly see are 3450, 1140, 860, and 690 RPM motors. Motors, either single phase or three phase, and whether they are open drip proof, totally enclosed, or rated for hazard location, will have a nameplate with the motor RPM labeled. Each motor manufacturer's motor nameplate design is slightly different, so take some time to locate the RPM for the motor on your fan. Here we have a belt driven fan with a variable speed drive set, also commonly referred to as a variable pitch drive set. In this video, you will also see a device referred to as a belt tensioner. As we said, the most common motor speed applied to belt driven fans is 1750, but the required fan speed to deliver the specified performance is almost always different than the motor speed. To achieve a fan speed other than the motor speed, belt driven fans use a combination of different pulley or shiv diameters on the motor and fan shafts to increase or decrease the fan speed compared to the motor speed. If the motor pulley and fan pulley are the same diameter, the fan will operate at the motor speed. On this fan, the fan pulley is larger than the motor pulley. As you can see, for every revolution of the motor pulley, the fan pulley only rotates less than one half of a revolution. So the fan shaft will rotate less than one half the motor speed. At this point, we need to talk safety. Before beginning to work on a fan, you will need to read and understand the manufacturer's installation and operation manual. Check with the manufacturer or manufacturer's rep to make sure that the fan and motor can operate safely at the desired new speed. Turn off the power to the fan motor before performing any work and take the proper steps to ensure the power cannot be turned on while the fan is being worked on. Now that we know how drives determine the fan rotating speed, let's see how to change the speed. This may be needed once the fan is installed to overcome additional system pressure. To change the speed of a belt driven fan, we must first remove the belt. The fan shown has a belt tensioner. The belt tensioner extends the life of the belt by maintaining proper tension. It has the added benefit of making belt removal extremely easy. Simply push on the belt tensioner until the belt can be slipped over the fan and motor pulleys. Most fans provided with motors of 5 horsepower or less should be specified or ordered with a variable speed or variable pitch drive set. The pulley mounted on the motor, sometimes referred to as the drive shiv, is adjustable and provides an adjustment range of approximately 20% or more without needing to replace the pulley. To adjust the effective diameter of the pulley, locate the set screw on the top of the pulley using the correct size hex key or allen wrench. Loosen but do not remove the set screw. To adjust the pulley, hold the bottom half of the pulley with one hand while turning the top half of the pulley. Do not force the pulley. If the top half of the pulley does not turn freely, then the shiv may be damaged and will need to be replaced. Turning the pulley clockwise closes the pulley, increasing its effective diameter and increasing the fan speed. Turning the pulley counterclockwise opens the pulley, decreasing the effective diameter and decreasing the fan speed. When setting the pulley, always turn the pulley clockwise until it's fully closed. From that point, turn it counterclockwise the appropriate number of turns to attain the proper speed. This setting is commonly referred to as the number of turns open. Once the desired setting is achieved, make sure the set screw lines up with the flat spot where there are not threads to interfere with the set screw. Tighten the set screw per manufacturer's recommendations, which can be found in the fan's installation and operation manual. Once this is completed, reinstall the belt. First, position the belt on the belt tensioner. Apply pressure to the tensioner and slip the belt over the fan and motor pulleys. Before running the unit, we must check belt alignment. When we change the effective diameter of the drive pulley, we also change the center line of the belt as it rides in that pulley. Now the belt is misaligned. Misalignment of the belt will cause increased belt wear, leading to premature failure of the belt. 
This also contributes to belt noise and additional horsepower required to turn the belt. For proper alignment, the center lines of the pulleys need to be in alignment. Aligning the tops of the pulleys will not ensure proper alignment and may compound the misalignment problem. To adjust the motor pulley for proper alignment, locate the set screws on the bottom side of the pulley. Some pulleys will only have one set screw, while others will have two set screws. Loosen, but do not remove the set screws. Raise or lower the pulley to achieve the proper belt alignment, visually checking that the centers of the pulleys are in alignment. Tighten the set screw per manufacturer's guidelines. Let's recap. Fan speed, how fast the fan impeller rotates, is a key factor affecting fan performance. Field adjustment of fan speed may be required to deliver proper fan performance. Always check for belt alignment after adjusting fan speed. Before working on a fan, always disconnect and lock out power in accordance with all recommended safety practices. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. Let's see. I'm going to try to override something here. Okay. Okay, Look, we went into proper belt tension on the video. We talked about the automatic belt tensioner, so we're not gonna recreate that, but there is, um, there's a lot of different things in the industry, questions about belt tensioners, things like that. There are uh, research projects that have taken place and if you think about it, it makes sense. If you keep that friction constant where it doesn't slip, it's not that constant readjustment. Let's face it, the frequent serviceability of products is not what it used to be because uh, service crews, whether it's owner on staff or, or hired, they don't have the ability to get around as much. So that's where these are popular. And it goes from there. Now, drive loss, a belt-driven fan is not tested with the friction between the belts and shifts. It's only cataloged fan brake force power. Okay, so there's actually AMCA, uh, Air Movement Controls Association International. There's publication and it addresses drive loss. That drive loss is an estimate and you can see the chart that's actually from the AMCA publication, slow, medium, and high. We've adapted it and put it into the engineering cookbook so you have that. You don't have to go pay a hundred and some bucks to get that. Um, but did anybody wonder where this came from? This is actually 1960s and 1970s data. This is the actual reports. I've had that in my library um, for quite a while, and that shows the percentage, and that was, emphasis on the word, state-of-the-art research up until just a few years ago. And it was a challenge but eventually, ASHRAE greenlit a project back in 2016 to further that research from the 60s and 70s. And so there is actually, uh, it's a research project, 1769. It's wrapping up right now. I don't know how many of you went to Atlanta. Um, there was a proposal uh, to do a presentation on that. It'll probably take place in Tampa um, because that's one of the deliverables. And part of the reason on this is the Department of Energy. And this is a whole 
different discussion for a different day, and it's an hour plus discussion in and of itself. But the Department of Energy is naturally wanting to decrease the amount of energy usage in buildings. And one of the usages is via fans, whether it's internal to an air handler, whether it's external, standalone, and everything else. But belt drives, there is energy usage with and friction loss between a belt and a ship. Makes sense? That's why a part of this research project was to go in there. So that has that research project has essentially concluded. It does address even things like belt, automatic belt tensioners. And it goes in there and it's to update and expand that original data set from the 60s and 70s so that people can know on that. And that's uh, Research Project 1769. Um, it is finished, um, just final dots to the I's and T cross T's, that type of thing, but it's all it's all done. So, so Brent, if an engineer is selecting a fan, a belt drive fan, and they're trying to account for drive loss, I know like our selection software, other selection softwares, all have that component built in. Not all, but most. Most. Yeah. <laughs> so do the, do, when you're accounting for belt loss, is that purely getting a safety factor in the brake horsepower? Or is that actually taking account a reduction in the speed that that fan will move, in which case you would possibly need to. That's a great question. A, a That's a great idea. question. So it does not account for a potential reduction in speed because that drive selection will be accounted to get that speed, okay. but it does take into account the brake horsepower versus horsepower. Okay. So you hit on a very important topic, and um, I don't know that you meant to do that, but you did great. And um, <clears throat> if you do not account for it, and this is going to be addressed a little bit in this video, but it's also when I do the fan curve session on Thursday, um, if you do not account for drive loss and you're right at the um, edge and your software does not allow you to account for drive loss. And that's why I made the statement in some, but not all, you will come up short. Now, we're going to talk about smoke control here in a little bit, depending upon which version that you fall under code-wise for smoke control, you may have to have extra belts. The more, eh, the more belts you have, I love it. Everything's running fine. And then Microsoft says, hey, we're doing an update. Oh, no. Yeah, that's okay. No, it's all good. I think this will still work. Um, if not, send your love notes to <laughs> Bill Gates. Um, anyway, where's it going with that? Okay, so you may be short accounting for your brake horsepower versus your horsepower, particularly if you have to get into multiple, aka extra belts, depending upon a local code interpretation of some very vague code language. I know code language is crystal clear everywhere in the United States, much less the world, but we'll go from there. I, I don't want to give away too much before we go there, but Josh was reading ahead in the back of the book, and I thank him for that. So, uh, um, it's very important, particularly on belt driven fans, that you don't run right up to the red line, just as if you're driving a sports car, you don't keep it at the red line all the time in third gear when you ought to be in fifth gear or sixth gear. Make sense? Okay. So let's do the drive loss video. 
Chris Carl's. Yeah. All right. Come on, Bill. Ah, always oh, more than one way to make something work. Thank goodness Microsoft didn't buy uh, Zoom. Okay, drive loss. Let's see it in real life. <clears throat> Drive loss, what it is and how to account for it. When selecting belt drive fans, it is important to consider drive loss. Drive loss is the energy that is consumed by the drive components, which commonly includes bearings, belts, and pulleys. Sometimes it includes couplings and can include items like gears and VFDs. This diagram, adapted from AMCA Standard 203, shows how drive losses vary over the typical range of horsepower applied to fans and blowers. You can see the diagram shows losses as a percentage of motor output power versus the actual motor horsepower. The middle line represents an average and can be used to estimate drive loss unless more information is available for a specific application. As the chart indicates, smaller motors tend to have greater drive loss on a percentage basis. Some software selection programs allow you to account for drive loss when selecting belt drive fans. Let's take a look at the impact of drive loss on fan energy consumption. In this demonstration, we are using a single phase third horsepower motor, as well as a watt meter to measure energy consumption in real time. First, we will energize the motor without any connected load. The motor consumes power, in this case roughly 122 watts, even without a load. When we connect to a shaft and bearings via a direct coupling, the power consumption jumps to approximately 140 watts, an increase of nearly 15%. If we connect the motor to shaft and bearings in the conventional method with a common V-belt, the power consumption jumps again, this time to almost 175 watts, varying as the belt tension changes. The additional energy is related to the friction between the belt and shiv, and the energy necessary to flex the belt as it goes around the pulleys. A belt that is in bad condition will consume about the same amount of power, but as can be seen here, will cause vibration that is bad for the fan, the motor, and the bearings. Additionally, improper belt alignment can cause increased power consumption, reduce belt life, and can introduce harmful vibration. To recap, for proper selection of belt drive fans, drive loss should be considered in the power consumption of the fan. Smaller motors experience a higher percentage of drive loss than do larger motors. Proper installation and alignment of drives is important in reducing fan energy consumption and minimizing maintenance. Check belts periodically to make sure they are in good condition and properly aligned and tensioned to minimize unnecessary vibration. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. Okay, so we've kind of beat into the ground on belt drive fans. Now we're going to talk about direct drive fans. Any questions on belt drive fans? Pros and cons? You feel comfortable that you can discuss that? We did a deep dive like we promised. Now let's get into direct drives. It's directly coupled. This is an arrangement four, but there are different styles. You can have an arrangement eight. So you can actually still have bearings with the direct drive fan. And if you don't believe me, take a look in the front part of the engineering cookbook that you all have in front of you, and you go from there. So there are pros and cons of the different direct drives uh, arrangements, and that goes into a little bit deeper than what we've got time for here. We've seen some of this. 
So this is one of the things that I often tell my seven-year-old. You get what you get, so don't throw a fit. How many of you heard that before? How many of you said it before? Okay, so we touched on this briefly earlier. Um, had it included in one of that earlier videos, but the motor RPM. So you can actually go and download this paper. I didn't print it off, um, but a motor is rated in horsepower and RPM as well as voltage, okay, and phase. So these are the most popular one. The video doesn't talk about a 540 RPM, but I throw it in there because I do have several clients that do use 540 RPM. Um, they're very, very expensive. Okay, 1725 is the most popular motor RPM out there, the most readily available. 3450 is the next, just like the video shared. The 3450, which is a nominal 3600 RPM, is more expensive than the 1725 or the also known as the 1770. Some of those motor RPMs switched a little bit when uh, premium efficiency became the norm about 15 years ago. Okay, 1140, a little bit more expensive. Now, the 3600 RPM, depending upon the horsepower, it can be more expensive than 1140. It can be um, less expensive than 1140. That's why I have it shifted out to the side a little bit. The 860 starts to get a lot more expensive than the 1140. Leak time, a little bit more, but it's not normally a killer. If the 680, it's a real killer. I had a hospital. Full disclosure, I discouraged them heavily. I discourage a lot of my teams heavily to stay away from 680 RPM motors. Lead times are extremely long. This hospital was converting their garage ventilation from belt drive to direct drive simply because they didn't have the staff to go and maintain the bearings and the belts. Those, that order was placed with the motor manufacturer the first part of May. Anybody want to guess when those 680 RPM motors arrived? I get. Uh, actually, it was December. They did arrive December, but and that was truthfully, it was a miraculous event that they arrived that soon. Okay, so not in all cases, and that's not a dig at the motor manufacturer. It's just that's not a frequently utilized deal. And now we're going to talk a little bit about why some of these are different. In the 540s, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to flat out put it this way. If you get a 680 or a 540 RPM, you better order some extras at the same time because if you have an electrician that shorts it or anything else, or heaven forbid, even when we're assembling and starting that up, we have a DOA motor, you're not going to get a replacement one very quick. You're going to go into the next cycle. And the other thing is, and this is one of the things that some of my clients have learned the hard way, never store a motor on a concrete slab. Anybody know why? Moisture? Yes, it absorbs the moisture up out of the concrete, gets into the motor bearings, and it causes the motor to fail. Rust on the inside. All right, so I like this paper. Out of some very good things in there. Um, Talks about speed, frequency, and poles, but I'm getting right here. So this is why as you go down in speed, the number of poles increases. That's also part of the reason why the expense goes up. I just think that's a pretty clear thing. So you have a 14-pole motor for your nominal 540 RPM. Motor. Makes sense? Okay. All right. So our online software, how many of you have tried out our online software before? Our install version. Okay. If not, you have the opportunity to. It's called Cook Select. It has a lot of tools in it. Um, but I do this because we show a selection grid. And that didn't quite turn out on this the way that I hoped, but it talks, it shows the um, different motor RPM for the direct drives. So you can see them. You can sh it shows whether it's controlled with no control 
and it's a full tilt RPM, or if it's adjusted with the wheel width to zero in on a performance versus a speed of a motor, or if it's controlled via an EC style motor, or it's controlled via a variable frequency drive. The software will tell you all that and you can pick what you'd like and go from there. So direct drive speed adjustment. How do we accomplish that? Yes, Josh. Is it incorrect or is it bad practice to select a fan with an over speed RPM? I prefer not to. And the reason I prefer not to is because I have yet to find a system that identically matches once installed what was drawn and calculated on a, on a plan. Now, that allows you the ability in most cases to speed up and have a little bit of safety factor. Now, what is an acceptable safety factor on an over, on over speed? Depends on your drive, depends upon your system, depends on your electrical quality at the site. And Josh is going like you're dancing around the answer, Brian. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I, just, no. I run across this. And Absolutely, no. It's a great question, I'm, and I'm I'm having a little bit of fun with Josh right off the bat here. Now he he is asking very good questions, and I hope you all realize that even though Josh and I are having a little bit of fun with each other, there's serious issues, and there's no nothing cut and dried, but the quality of the electrical. So how many of you ever got into voltage drops on calculations? Yeah, we normally leave that for the sparkies, but we do get involved in that. So what's a voltage drop? Is the voltage condition on a large building, is that the same throughout the building? Very rare, okay? So if you have lower voltage at a product, can it act differently than if you have the correct voltage? Darn skippy. Now it can be low or it can be high. Wait a minute, what the heck's he talking about? And if you don't believe me, go about three and a half hours south of here. There's a prison out in the middle of nowhere in the state of Illinois. It's right near a main substation. That main substation was actually delivering very high voltage to the prison. That very high voltage was going throughout part of the electrical systems at the prison. And it started toasting things. And everybody was scratching their head of why is it toasting things? To the point that motor postmortems and product postmortems for all sorts of different things. And I'm not talking just the fans, I'm talking many things from different manufacturers took place. I can talk about it because that was more than 20 years ago. And it was all because the voltage was too doggone high. Motors from different products actually were oversaturated and it failed. So high is bad. Low is bad. Now, let's add more complexity to a system. Let's add a VFD. Now we're starting to adjust the frequency. And that's all separate from the airflow requirement. Makes sense? So we got to have airflow to meet a system requirement, but we've got to have a way to get the airflow for that system requirement. So what Josh was touching on, what level of comfort do you have with safety factor? Are you one that likes to run it right up to the red line and have no safety factor? Probably not. Are you one that likes to have oodles and gobs of safety factor? Probably not. You want to find something that's right in the middle range because if you have way too much safety factor, it's not necessarily efficient. And when I say not necessarily efficient, while you will still be able to find things in fan selection software currently, 
as the DOE requirements come into play, we will be prohibited, most likely, from showing you some inefficient fan selections. And it's not just Cook, it's everybody. Because the higher up the fan curve you are, the more efficient selection you are. But the higher up the fan curve you are, the closer to the red line you're running. So you better not have some extra elbows and transitions and everything else. And if you want to learn more on part of that, come back on Thursday. Yeah, that's a plug for the Thursday class. But if you want to really do a deep dive on some of that, come back another time and we'll we'll do a whole nother presentation on things like that. Because that's a full hour in and of itself. And it gets very hairy very quickly. And some of that is changing rapidly. Anybody ever heard of the term FEG? Well, that's all gone. Now there's something called FEI, and it may even morph a little bit more. So fan energy index. Oh, yeah. And in the old terms, that's still in some code language, fan efficiency grade, but fan efficiency grade's gone. So that's just a plug for some other learning opportunities. Okay, so what are the ways to control? Easiest way? Yes, sir. Sorry, Brett, this might be a little off topic, but yeah. I know it's a pretty hot topic these days, especially down south of the border. You mentioned voltage spikes and our fan manufacturers looking into this 5,000 SCCR rating that's a requirement. And I know I've been hearing about it in the last six months quite often. Yeah, and 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 now Mark picked up the next item. Thank you. No, 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 that was good. I was expecting it, and and that that was I was going to lay a hook out for that in a little bit, but Mark was looking at the answer in the back of the book. That truthfully and transparently is more Sparky World than Fan World because that's the electrical system. Our Fan manufacturers being pulled into that a little bit. Yes, we get pulled into it from the voltage drop to an uncertain extent. Um, Who's responsible for it? It's really the Sparkies. They're looking at equipment manufacturers. Yeah, I know. I know. And, and part of that, but it still goes back to the electrical system in and of itself. So um, there are some things still being ironed out from that standpoint. But at the end of the day, it is still Sparky World versus Equipment World. And because, and you hit on it right when you ask the question, the electrical conditions on that. So it's an electrical system and how it affects the equipment, not the equipment and how it affects the electrical system. So I'm not trying to dodge the answer. It's just there's still a lot of things being worked out, and there are limits to what an equipment can supply, but the motor and the electrical is the item on that, not the mechanics of the product. Makes sense? Um, and I'm not trying to avoid it. I'm just there's you're getting into a gray area issue. There's a lot of discussions on that and how to address that and how to be helpful from the equipment side. But yet at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that have to be pulled in from the electrical world vis-a-vis -vis the motors and, and that type of thing and the electrical design. So good question, absolutely. And, and I was gonna hit on that a little bit later, but I, I'd rather grab the bull by the horns and, and do it right now. Well, I heard using fusing and such to prevent a building getting cooked is yeah. kind of what they're looking to do. It, it, that's that's one item. And then there's a whole different things, just like on a VFD, um, a shaft grounding ring, motor, uh, a, a shaft grounding strap, different things that go into the entire electrical system design on that. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct, Mark. And you're on the, the exact path, and that's why things come into play. So different ways of speed. Obviously, the VFD comes in by, but what about that PSC and the shaded pole motors that Josh had asked about earlier? 
the little single phase ones that a lot of them got ruled out of existence by a stroke of a pen because they're not efficient. They're basically little heaters. Now that's not exactly true, but they use a lot of heat. They lose a lot of the efficiency by heat. So the little fan speed controllers. Um, and we talked about the EC motors earlier today. We talked about the speed controller on that, as well as the onboard speed pots. So maximum speed capabilities. Right there is the selection grid. And let's zero in on a couple of things. And I'm sorry, that's not quite coming out. Uh, Tom had done a good job of, of doing a little intro to this on uh, one of his uh, blog posts on there. And uh, so I have all of these selections are a 27 inch little utility event set. So a unit like this one that's back here on the demo, 27 inch diameter wheel. I have a nominal 10,000 CFM at two inches worth of pressure. Okay, the first one, which is kind of a little hard to see, but it's a full width wheel. I'm talking width of the wheel. Hey, awesome, good deal. That looks great. Will you be my assistant on all these when I travel? Yeah. Um, so, 100% wide, because let's go back to the old water wheel analogy. I like to always use this. A paddle wheel on an old Mississippi River boat can have a width. It rotates at a speed. The wider the width, the more scooping ability it has. But it can't develop as much pressure. Makes sense? You narrow the width, and it doesn't scoop as much. So this first one is actually 10,540. Can you see that? Yeah, it's a little blurry. But the first one, take my word for it. If not, go online, register, get you free access to the software and you can run it. And the first one on there at 100% wide will be 10,549 CFM at two inches. Are you worried about the extra 549 CFM? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. If you are worried about it, you can have a narrower width wheel, actually shave off 8% of that width of the wheel, and that'll get you 10,000 CFM right on the dot. Now, what if you wanted to use an EC motor? That's the third one down. You can control that speed by adjusting the speed of the EC motor. So you can control the volume by narrowing the width of the wheel, or you can control the volume by the speed of the motor. Easy peasy. Now, an EC motor, we talked about that. What if you did a standard induction motor? Well, that'd be a VFD. Well, we've got that. Now, we're gonna look at all the different brake horsepower and also the motor horsepower. The first two, had a seven and a half horsepower motor installed. The third one has a 15 horsepower installed. Well, why the heck would you have a 15 horsepower motor installed? Okay, now we're gonna look at some stuff that looks a lot easier to see. So this one is that first one, 10,000 CFM, 100% wheel width, 60 Hertz on the speed. The brake horsepower is 6.451, and it's 1160 RPM motor. Once again, we're just dealing with direct drive motors. We're off the belt drive motor, I'm sorry. Static efficiency, 61%. And the maximum speed that you could overdrive this is 1,396 RPM. So going back to Josh's earlier question about Max speed and overdriving. One of the points, and I said we put a pin in part of it, is you can only spin a wheel so fast. So even though that our selection is 1160 RPM at 60 Hertz, we could speed this up if we needed a little extra, but we cannot cross red line of 1396, or we run the risk of flying the wheel apart. Make sense? 
Okay. And I'm not getting into the sound and everything else. That's a whole different ball game. Okay, so this is the fan curve. We read straight up and over for the brake horsepower. Now let's go back to the 92%. 60 hertz, 1160s. 1396, we're right on the 10,000 CFM. Remember, previously we we're at 10,549. Okay, now let's go to this 15 horsepower. We're going to put a pin in part of that and come back to that here in a little bit. We're going to skip over that one that had the 15 horsepower, and we're going to go to the next one that has a 7.5 horsepower. Notice that has, once again, an 1,100 RPM. Okay. The max wheel construction speed is still 1396 RPM, which shouldn't be a surprise because that's what it was for the other 27 inch diameter wheel. The max speed with the current motor is 1219. So if you turn that motor up all the way, you're only gonna be able, you're gonna run out of horsepower at 1219 RPM. Makes sense? Seeing a few glassy eyes, I'm seeing some head bobs. If you have a question, don't hesitate because I dare say there's somebody else that has the same question. Yes, sir. All right. How did you figure out that 1219 was the max RPM for that motor? Outstanding. It's something called the fan laws. And keep the pin in that. And we're going to go through it. Okay. So maximum speed. Pull that pin out. Notice that 1500 are the 15 horsepower motor. We're gonna go back to that one. Max speed with current motor, 1396. We were at 1200 and something before, right? So with that motor, if we run all the way up to the 1396, we're gonna need more than, even though we're only using 5.506 brake horsepower for that performance point, but if we run it all the way up, we're going to need more than the seven and a half horsepower motor. And let's take a look at this. Okay. <laughs> I like Tom's little deal. So, fan law. How many of you used the fan laws before? You? Great. If you haven't, come back to Thursday and we're going to do more. So I input the 10,000 CFM on the left. I input the two inches of pressure. What is the speed? 1100, 5.506, and I sped it up to 1396. And it's grayed out a little bit, but it's 11.25 brake horsepower. So we couldn't use a 10 which would be the next horsepower up from seven and a half, we had to go to the 15. So that's why that selection has a 15 horsepower motor on it. Make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Why is it unavailable if we're picking against an engineer schedule and say a manufacturer has an EC motor that has a seven and a half horse motor there. But our proprietary software doesn't allow us to select that. Is that purely for protecting the fan? It's protecting the fan and protecting the engineer from himself to be truly transparent. And it also provides an opportunity for discussion to go through something just like this for educational purposes. Now, does that mean that we couldn't put a 20 horsepower on this one? No, we could. But this is one of those things that as the water gets murkier and murkier, it's more an opportunity for discussions one-on-one -on -one because let's face it, it's really easy to put the coins in the slot machine and pull the lever on the slot machine and see what pops out on a fan selection and go from there. And I dare say in the last three years, 
I have a lot of that. Because some of the educational opportunities have not been there for this specific reason that I'm outlining. Yes, sir. So um, obviously 1396 is the mechanical limit limit of that fan. So whether or not you get the drive from us or Doesn't DC matter. motor. 1396 is your stop sign. You have to limit it. So a person programming the VFD in the field, or if you use this EC motor, that will come from the factory limited to that fan's mechanical max, correct? That is correct. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, all right. And the handbook. How many of you use the handbook? Yes, we all have. I have to put a plug in for it because I helped write, write it and update it and everything else. So the fan laws goes back there. The fan laws are right in there. Simplified version, CFM varies directly with the RPM. Static pressure varies with the square. Horsepower, AKA brake horsepower varies with the Q. Okay. It's also in your engineering cookbook in front of you. And motor strap grinding. All right, I've got a video on this. Uh, yeah, we're, we're running close on time. I'm a little bit behind, but we'll go ahead and play this. Motors with VFDs produce shaft voltage, resulting in high-frequency ground currents that arc across bearing surfaces, causing them to deteriorate. This is often referred to as electrical discharge machining. To see evidence of the harmful effects of shaft voltage, let's look at a couple of bearing grease samples. The first sample shows what normal bearing grease looks like. The second sample shows grease that has been contaminated by metallic particles from the bearings in an ungrounded motor with stray currents passing through it. The bearing race and bearing balls arc as they rotate and these metallic particles are formed and incorporated into the grease, reducing its effectiveness and further deteriorating the bearing components. In this picture, you can see a bearing race with what is commonly referred to as fluting. fluting is pitting caused by electrical discharge machining and has put this bearing on the path to failure. To eliminate this problem, shaft grounding is recommended. To demonstrate the effectiveness of shaft grounding, we are using a one horsepower general purpose motor powered using a VFD. The VFD is used to control the motor speed. Our demo has a shaft grounding ring mounted on a piece of plastic the plastic mount is for demonstration purposes only. It isolates the grounding ring from any ground paths. A shaft grounding ring has conductive brushes that touch the shaft continuously as it rotates. On the oscilloscope display, we see spikes. The spikes reflect the charge that is building up on the shaft and being discharged through the bearings. When we connect the shaft grounding ring to a grounded piece of metal, in this case, a machine screw, the oscilloscope flatlines. This is an indication that the current has found another path to ground. The shaft grounding ring provides a path of less resistance, bypassing the shaft and bearings. If, instead, we touch the ground to the motor housing, the oscilloscope does not flatline indicating that the stray currents are again traveling through the motor bearings. This is because the paint film on the motor casing is non-conductive. When connecting the shaft grounding ring, verification of the ground path is critical. Let's recap. VFDs produce ground currents that pass through motor shaft and bearings, causing electrical deposition machining, which results in premature bearing failures. The use of a shaft grounding ring can eliminate this problem, increasing the longevity and reliability of electrical motors. In order for the shaft grounding ring to work properly, connection to ground must be made and verified. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. Okay. That last little disclaimer on the video, I cannot stress enough. Shaft 
grounding rings do not guarantee a get out of jail free. They do reduce the percentage, but I have had motors destroyed that even had the shaft grounding ring. And why? Here's a perfect example of a motor failure report right there at the bottom. Grounding ring was installed in motor from factory, recommend insta installing ground strap to motor at drive and eliminating earth ground and eliminating um, the failure of the earth to ground. So the electrical system at the job site did not protect the motor with proper grounding. So even though the shaft grounding ring was helping protect the motor from the VFD spike, the motor still failed because the electrical ground did not take place. Now, can a manufacturer protect against an improper ground at a job site? No, there's not. This is part of the electrical design of the system. That's why there are electricians that are to do the checks in the field. Okay, getting in sparky world, I know that, but I can't stress this enough because the shaft grounding ring does not guarantee that it can overcome other items in the electrical system. And that's a real world example right off the bat. I don't care if it's a pre-wired service switch. I don't care what it is from the factory. At the end of the day, that is 100% a field installation item. Yes, sir. Recommendation to have the drive closer to the motor? That could help, but if you still have a fault on the earth and the ground, you can have the motor right on the unit and it still won't make a hill's worth of beans. The closer the drive is to the motor, the longer life you'll get, but if you still have that earth to ground failure, it will fail. I happen to know this system very well. I was involved in it. And the drive was remotely away, but I don't care if it would have been mounted on the fan. That ground system was not adequate. You had a question, sir. Do you have any kind of recommended language for any kind of testing that could be done at installation time of that ground path? That's a great question. Um, it would normally go in the Sparky section of the specs, and it would be a verification by the electrical contractor that the, the ground is adequate and they can do that and sign off on that and that's simplified i mean you can get into more technical verbiage that type of thing but <clears throat> ground straps don't hurt as an additional accessory and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to sell sell electrical components that's not what i'm doing but if if there are specific questions then you add that that may be required depending upon Earth the ground verification of the specific system upon installation. Great Where question. Everybody specifying shaft grounding rings, one using a VFD. I'd say probably, well, on the smaller horsepowers, the shaft grounding rings cost as much as the motors. So a lot of folks won't do it. Um, when you get the higher horsepowers, they do it all the time. But even if you have the shaft grounding ring and you have an earth to ground fault, 
and then you're going to do a bill's worth of beans. So, yes, sir. When swiping a motor that's being controlled by a VFT, say that it is a VFT compatible motor. Yeah, but that still doesn't take into account potential spikes. Okay, so would you still select a ground? I would, unless truthfully, one horsepower and below, I wouldn't even bother. Okay. Is the price of the ring is more than so the higher on horsepower, the more after it's still three horsepower and above. I definitely have the grounding ring on it, even with the compatible one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, because you can have so many different electrical spikes from the system. Once again, that goes back to a little bit. Mark alluded to it: the distance between the drive and the the motor itself. Um, that's part of it. This is just an additional wrinkle among past that because the earth to ground. Um, I have a very qualified engineer that's struggling with this right now. And it's like, no, this is an earth to ground. I, I can't account for it at the factory. And uh, so, all right, AMCA, I'm going to rush through a couple of things. For those of you who don't know, that's like the NCAA advance. Um, and the, I've got a reason why I'm throwing this in there. So the AMCA website, regional offices around the world, uh, the AMCA headquarters are just down the road a piece in Chicago. And But here's where the certified products, you can look them up. Also, um, standards and publications all come from that. And here's the reason why. We're going to talk at specific requests about AMCA spark resistant construction. You didn't know you were gonna necessarily talk about AMCA spark resistant construction. The depth that we're gonna talk about, you knew we were gonna talk about a little bit. But my favorite, favorite little item is on the left-hand side of your packet. And it says the explosion proof fan. This little publication has been beat into the ground by every fan manufacturer with every consulting engineer since this came out in 1998. Why has this been beat into the ground? Because, once again, we have Sparky World, we have Fan World. They do overlap, but they are not mutually exclusive. So, Ampia has a standard. It's standard 99. Very expensive if you want to buy it, or I can make your life a whole lot easier. I'm showing you part of it. But this is AMCA spark resistant, emphasis on the word spark resistant, not spark proof. And just as in the bold in this AMCA document, there's no such thing as an explosion proof fan. There is no such thing as a spark proof fan. Okay, but there's levels of spark resistant. This is the AMCA spark resistant construction standard. Two pages, it's been adopted. It's an ANSI document, everything else. Your handy dandy engineering cookbook. You can get it electronically. You can get it on your app. You can look at it there. This is an abridgment of the standard. You have it to love and behold. From this day forward, since this is Valentine's Day, you can cherish it, you can love it, but it has that. But one thing to note, there just as in the standard, there are notes for spark resistant construction. Item one, no bearings, drive components, or electrical devices shall be placed in the air or gas stream unless they are constructed or enclosed in such a manner that failure of that component cannot ignite the surrounding gas stream. This is why you may not have bearings in the air stream. There is some debate, but it is clear as a bell, there is no vagueness or anything else. A bearing, if it is not maintained, will have metal to metal contact metal to metal contact what can happen sparks yes so that's why that is one of the notes now the rest of the stuff oh the, the user shall electrically ground all fan and or damper parts 
Hmm. Did we just talk about that in detail? I almost think that I kind of laid this presentation out for a reason. Yeah. All right. So, spark resistant construction. We do talk about this in some of our marketing brochures. We do that, but we have levels of A, B, and C. A is the most strenuous, C is the least strenuous if you get into this. The software, it does have that. So, you can actually go in and make selections and pick that. And if you want further descriptions, the software will pop up and tell you that, whether you use the install software or the online. But B, go from there. The explosion proof fan. I've seen this in so many specs. I was guilty of it when I was a consultant 28 years plus ago. Okay? You cannot use the term explosion proof. Well, Wait a minute. NEMA's got some stuff for service switches, AKA disconnect switches and everything else. Yeah, that's all fine and great. That's Sparky world, okay? So you now to have in the hold so this day forward, have a copy of there is no such thing as an explosion proof fan right there. There's also no such thing as a spark proof fan. You have all of that with you from forward. Okay. Have we muddied the water? As I told you, there was going to be a lot of little hot button little topics that we we're going to go through and kind of hit in this last 45 minutes that are remaining. UL listings and classifications. Were you aware that you can go to the UL website and you can now you any of the documents for free that happened during COVID. You do have to register, but you can look at that and get that. UL 705, you may have heard that. That's a standard for safety for power ventilators. It's, I dare say that's probably in almost every firm's specs, but unless you were in the Sparky world, you probably didn't do a deep dive on it, but this is the opportunity for you. If you so decline or decide and are having an issue with insomnia, it's a wonderful cure. It should take care of you in about less than 20 minutes. Uh, so looking at this, it talks about the scope, standard and everything else, but it basically goes safety. That if it comes from the factory, it is UL705 listed. You shouldn't get a quote unquote charge out of life. Now, if you want to get in technicalities, if the product comes from the factory and it does not have the motor set up with it, now, obviously, you, you get the larger horsepower the motors have to be removed for shipping, but the motor was what the unit was tested and everything else. You can't get a UL listing. So if you buy a motor local and install it on a product, you don't have UL705 because it wasn't able to be done at the factory and goes from there. Okay, now, NFPA 70, that reference is right there. We're gonna talk about NFPA here in just a second from several aspects. Gee, voila, now you can go to nfpa.org and Guess what is now available to view free of charge? You can't print any of this, but you also have free access to everything as well. So NFBA 70, that's also known as the National Electric Code. And guess what? It's just been updated for 2023. Woohoo! And so you can do that. So let's talk about UL Classified. We hit on this a little bit earlier in this in this educational session. So the Airstream, I said we were going to put a pen in it and come back to it later. I keep my promises. I get forgetful every now and then, but I keep my promises. So like a material handler, you can't have a UL listed product because there's dust, dirt, different things like that. So those can be UL classified. So because the environments it's in, it's a little bit different, but you still can have 
a UL level of safety for them. So Tom had specifically spelled out, he wanted to talk about uh, UL smoke control. Um, Power ventilation for smoke control is something that's actually near and dear. Um, one of our retired individuals actually worked hand in hand with UL back in late 80s because I'm showing my age, different regional codes all over. Anybody ever hear of something called BOCA, International Mechanical Code, Southern Building Code, all different things? They all had different requirements and then if you got outside of the United States it really got even murky well it was causing a lot of headaches not only for Lauren Cook Company but different fan manufacturers because okay this part of the country this and then if you added a different uh code official that would come up with something different and went from there so let's try to find a you all or some sort of standard. So Lauren Cook Company actually approached UL, hey, can we pull some of these different things and come up with a standard? They said, well, we can't really do a standard, but we can do an outline of investigation. It's a little bit different, um, but the whole UL power ventilator for smoke control was born. And you can see different types of products. Now, originally it was 500 degrees for four hours, 1000 degrees for 15 minutes. That was all well and good. Remember, but I said international stuff. Well, that started getting involved and they had different temperature limits. Remember in the United States, we like Fahrenheit. Overseas, they like Celsius, different things like that. Um, so different temperatures and durations for different products as the power ventilator for smoke control evolved over a period of time. So that's why you see different charts, different styles, even different types of typical installations. But at the end of the day, when there is a power failure on a building, and the emphasis on the word, when there's a power failure, because during a fire event, you will either hit a point where the building power fails from the fire, or the electrical is cut because for protection of the people doing that. These are smoke exhausts to allow people to get out of the building, but it's also smoke exhaust to clear the smoke. So these products are also designed to act as gravity smoke exhaust ventilation when the power is no longer present. Okay, that's why there's like fuse link dampers overcome snow load on the butterfly damper styles or some of the different styles. Okay, makes sense. So different um, items for smoke controls for different products. We have some of that in the marketing brochures in different temperatures. It's also in the software. Now, I often get questions about smoke control design resources. Um, I like to throw this in because a lot of folks get into different things. There's a wonderful publication that um, ASHRAE helped fund. Um, it's the Handbook of Smoke Control Engineering. Uh, John Clo, he's um, basically a legend in this type of research. Um, this is some of the chapters outlining all that, some of the different types. So you can pressurize and you can exhaust. There's different styles depending on the building, that type of thing. One of the things I do want to hit on, because this comes up frequently, the makeup error. There is not a UL listing for these types. So um, supply error is not the same as power ventilator for smoke control. It can be if you do set up certain things, but supply air fans don't fall under that UL currently. So you won't find a supply fan that is UL listed power ventilator for smoke control um, for those types of systems. You can do an exhaust and use that as supply and do something like that. But that's a gray area that is kind of coming up a little bit more frequently from different code officials. So I did want to throw that in there, but it's, it's mainly the exhaust system 
Um, ASHRAE also has the atrium calculator. So I get a lot of questions on, well, how do I do that? Well, I can't design it for you, but I can show you some resources and everything else that is available through that same deal on that. There's also, if you need to do a deeper dive for the Society of Fire Protection Engineers, um, there's different guidelines and benefits on that. And that all goes hand in hand with that handbook that I just showed you that is also from ASHRAE. All right, any questions on smoke control? Like I said, I'm trying to hit several little requested topics right off the bat, so I'm not doing super deep dives. You all kitchen exhaust. This one's a fun one. What you all number comes to mind when we talk about you all kitchen exhaust? 762, right? Did you know 762 no longer exists? Oh, really? <laughs> but it's still in code. It's all over the place. Actually, let's go back to 705. This was revised during COVID. It's still a fairly big uproar amongst manufacturers, code officials, code language, and everything else. But if you look at 705, there is now an addendum. It's power roof ventilators for restaurant exhaust appliances. Now, I'm not going to say one is right versus the other if you make a reference to 762. I'm just telling you what is out there and what has transpired. Make sense? Okay. High temperature testing, you said grease lard on, on fire and burn that. And it's got to go through there. So there is a, quote, UL test standard to get this restaurant exhaust. You have to meet all the requirements of 705 to even consider UL restaurant itself. Okay, makes sense. Then there are different temperature settings depending upon the style of cooking that you may have. So there's 300 degrees and 500 degrees is the two most typical. And if you have one of our old flyers like this, it used to say UL 762. Looks just the same, except now it says you all listed for restaurant exhaust. Why do we now say you all listed for restaurant exhaust? Because 762 got rolled into 705. All right. You have grease collection. You have limits of how much grease you can actually contain. We get requests all the time. Hey, can we have a bigger grease bucket? No, I can't sell it to you. That is actually part of the UL listing as far as the volume. So UL listed restaurant exhaust, you can go to NFBA and view NFBA 96 for free. And you can see that and that's all got all the clearance combustibles, the exhaust, all of that is back from the NFBA 96 document. So if you knew it was out there, just didn't really know exactly where to look, now I'm showing you where it is, and guess what? One of the benefits of COVID is now you can view it for free. So um, one of the frequent questions is dampers. Can you have a damper and a grease-laden exhaust system? No, you can't. And I say that in reference to a typical style of damper. The reason you can't is because a typical style of damper is it collects grease and it poses a fire hazard. Makes sense? Now, let's look at 9.1.2. So, is this the clearest code language that you've ever seen in your life? 9.1.1, dampers shall not be installed in the exhaust ducts or exhaust duct systems. 9.1.2, hey, we're specifically listed. Yeah, you can do it. Well, they're not talking about backdraft dampers. And we get requests for that all the time. Same reason why on smoke exhaust, you can't have a backdraft damper, because that may, unless it fails open, because then that wouldn't allow the gravity smoke to exhaust. Make sense? Okay. So on this, they're talking about a damper being such that there are some that are listed that actually close the duct down instead of act as a backdraft damper. Okay. So that's why 9.1.2 exists. When it's clear in 9.1.1, you can't have a backdraft damper. So, murkiness, I know, but you know, hey, maybe 
just maybe it'll get you a pie wedge in Trivial Pursuit someday. No, <laughs> no. Okay. So you will see in some of our older marketing catalogs, we still reference 762. Some of the newer ones, we say UL restaurant exhaust, just as you'll have code language all over the place, 762 versus not. Now, this one's a fun one. This one's been around for years. How many of you had experience with ammonia exhaust? Fun times, isn't it? All right, now let's do a little bit of a deep dive. <clears throat> Um, I worked with a major food processor 20 years ago when some of this stuff was not even fully implemented, but it was starting and they were pulling their hair out. Um, took some of my hair too. But anyway, ammonia. So you've got OSHA, standard 29, Code of Federal Regulation, section 1910. This is one of the references to go to. But International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration, this is where a lot of this comes from. And they actually have a standard. It's actually standard 19, standard two, and it's been revised. The current version is 2021. And in that standard, <clears throat> exhaust fans may not have two ferrous parts able to rub or create a spark. Hmm. Does this sound familiar? AMCA spark resistant construction? Wow! Kind of cool how some of the stuff eventually all comes together, right? As we're coming up on the 12 o'clock hour? Yeah. Okay. Fan motors must be TEFC. If you really want to get into it, um, some of them want the explosion proof. That's some different deals. Why? Why do we have this requirement? Well, we're going to do a quickie right through the different motor enclosures. Before we conclude, uh, remember a TEFC is totally enclosed fan. So that has an, a limitation for potential of spark. Okay, doesn't say it gets out of jail. That's the explosion proof fan. Well, wait a minute, you just said there's no such thing as exploded proof fan. You gave me a document. Remember, there's a difference between sparky world and everything else. Okay. Multiple fans, multiple speeds a lot. So I have some folks that have two separate fans, one for emergency and then one for the two speed. Either way, they allow for it either way, but you have to have the ability to evacuate that ammonia if there is a leak or a failure. Minimum out of velocity of 2,500 feet per minute. This is the one that gets a lot of folks. There are things that we can do to construction of product to get 2,500 feet per minute. This is unfortunately also one of the things that is most frequently overlooked. Why do they need that 2,500 feet per minute? Well, the density of ammonia is different than the density of air. They want that ammonia to get up, up, and away, just like Superman, so it doesn't pool or come back. So that velocity is where that comes from, as well as a minimum air change of 30 air changes per hour. That's where all this comes from. So if you knew there were different things but didn't know where it came from, it's standard two. And I've got to throw this in there because I'm not practicing design. I'm not practicing engineering in the state of Wisconsin. There's additional project design requirements. It is my job just to help lead you in directions and then you make the final decisions. Okay, there's also two ASHRAE standards. They sell them as a combined. Standard safety of refrigeration system, standard 15, and standard 20, I'm sorry, 34, designation and safety classification of refrigerants. Those two also go hand in hand with standard two. And there is actually a commissioning guide that you can get, download that, and that comes into play. And then of course, uh, industrial, uh, government hygienists, they've got some things in their industrial ventilation handbooks. I still miss the, the printed red 
book, hardback book. Some an old school hardback book. It's nice to have the PDFs when I travel, but I like the old ones. They don't print them anymore. They're PDFs. Um, motor enclosures. I promised we were going to get back to it. So we're going to go into that. If you have the opportunity, you're more than welcome to come with one of the Airflow hosts to our corporate headquarters. This is just an example of one of our training items, training centers. Um, you can download this, the Cowern papers. Uh, Cowern was a regional manager for Baldur. It's now published under ABB, but I like the old printing. Um, they talk about all sorts of different motor enclosures. I have cutaways, show different things. You can do a deep dive if you want to see the differences. But here's the thing. See, can you tell I like exploded motor views? There's a reason, because you can see similarities and differences. But this is a cask motor house. That's all well and great. Just can't get them as often anymore. So this is an open drip proof motor. Notice that you can you have a straight shot in to the motor because it is open. Depending on the orientation, you can drip water on the top of it and it shouldn't come in. But if you take a spray hose and spray on it, or you sit it outside, or you can get water inside the motor, you sure are. Water and electricity mix very well? Not really. Um, so rolled steel, that's that. Cast iron, there you go. You can see the cast iron costs a whole lot more castings, everything else. That's why you can't get them as rugged anymore. Totally enclosed fan cool, TEFC. Now you can see the difference. I told you, put a pin in that and come back. See, there's a little fan at the end of that motor shaft. goes from there. Now, the drawback is, if you have this with a VFD and you slow the speed of the motor down, what's going to happen to that cooling fan? You're not going to provide the same amount of cooling to that motor. Make sense? But you can also see from that housing why they want that so you can't get the gas as easily in there. Now, I didn't say that there was no way to do it. I just said less likely. Rolled steel, cast iron. Explosion proof. Dagnabbit, you're talking about explosion proof and you're talking explosion resistant and you're, now you're starting to get all sorts of different things. See those rods on there? It just basically means it doesn't say that it can't ignite. It just shouldn't turn into shrapnel if it does ignite. And having been in the field when one of those things did ignite, I promise you, when that motor goes, you will be needing to go change your underwear at a point after that because it is a very scary thing. And that does happen. But it didn't turn into shrapnel. And went from there. Those rods are helped contain part of that. But you can see how it's very similar to the TEFC style unit. You can have the rolled steel. You can have the cast iron. Different ones on that. Now, in your booklet, the NEMA enclosure types. This is a publication that I go through reams and reams of paper. It drives our sales secretary nuts. But this is the document, and we have these all different types in the tech center so you can see. But the emphasis on the word is NEMA enclosure types on this document. You can have the same switch, electrical switch, but in a different style of box and it has a different rating. Makes sense? So this, you can go back and impress your Sparky friends that now you have the Rosetta Stone of all of the different types. What's the difference between a NEMA 3? What's the difference between a NEMA 3R? What's a 3S? What's a type one, type two? It's all in here. So, Maybe you'll get a pie wedge of Trivial Pursuit. But the nice thing about this is it's all here as a ready resource. This is published from NEMA. It is a PDF. Um, you have a printout of that. And those of you that are remote, you can just Google it and you can find the PDF online. It's, it's very, very simple. 
Next thing, as we're still talking about the electrical side of things, class and division ratings. Class and division ratings were one things that always gave mechanicals of my firm fits because the sparky side of the room and the code requirements came about on that. Well, we can go back to NFPA 70 and Article 500 on that, specifically towards, towards classified locations, class one, two, and three. Article 501 gives you class one locations, 502, class two, 502 also has class three, and NFPA 70 has additional articles and F NFPA documents. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. I really just want you to know that it's out there so you can go and do a deep dive. If you get drugged to the, as we used to call it, from the mechanical side of the department, the dark side of the department on the Sparky world, um, I actually did both sides. So I don't know. Yeah, and you all's got several things. And of course, the authority having jurisdiction has that as just a start. So you can go to the UL website. Once again, we look at that items for free. Any questions on the Sparky stuff? And this concludes the Sparky stuff before I lose more hair. <laughs> Let's talk about specialty coatings. There is a coatings brochure in your um, pamphlet. I've got a lot of coating resources, as well as corrosion resistance and chemical resistance guides. Those work hand in hand with different coating suppliers. Um, the nice thing about it is it not only talks about different chemicals, it also talks about different materials. So the coatings brochure, it, it gives you a lot of different things and that works hand in hand with the chemical resistance guide and different coatings of what is appropriate, what's not. So this is one of those things I like to show. Um, I know back ages and ages ago, um, and I, we sell fiberglass fans, longer lead time, they cost a whole lot, but there are coatings available now that are, it's a whole lot less expensive to coat a product than to have a fiberglass product and it can be obtained a lot faster. I'm not saying you shouldn't consider a fiberglass product, but I'm saying if cost and lead time is an item, you might wanna consider a coated product depending upon the chemical going through. This is one of those ones um, out there and that's, that's showing a phenolic epoxy coating. That's one of the typical coatings for lab exhaust fans. So we'll also talk about alternative fan construction materials. I'm not doing a real deep dive on this just in the interest of time, but I want you to see that besides the coatings, aluminum, steel, stainless steel, fiberglass, aluminum construction, where would that most popular come up with? If I haven't beat into the ground enough, amp is spark resistant construction. Yes. Stainless steel. It's more for temperature. This is actually a high temp coating. Um, they're not always the sexiest looking things out there, especially if you get heat because it will discolor under heat. So a lot of times we'll put a high temp coating on top of it just as an additional protection, but also so folks don't get alarmed on that. Now, I know you've probably seen highly polished stainless steel, that type of thing. That really doesn't happen in the normal fan world unless you're willing to pay oodles and gobs and a whole lot and wait a really long time. The, the stainless steel is used as either a chemical resistant or it's used for a temperature resistant and it goes from there. So um, that's an example of some stainless steel. This was actually an 850 degree um, system that I was involved in for Texas. Um, fiberglass, we already hit on that a little bit. And I ended just a tad bit early to account for any questions you might have. I know I threw a lot of topics at you. 
I know we hit on a few things. I appreciate the questions. I think we hit every topic that was listed on the class outline, as well as a few more that tied in naturally right off the bat. Any nagging questions that might be out there? Do we have any from out in the internet world? I put them all to sleep once again. All right, very good. Well, we cut out a couple of breaks, so you're still good on PDH time. So I'll let the airflow guys take care of that. Thank you very much.